keep on dancing. I'll keep on singing. Oh, keep praising, keep praising, keep praising. Keep praising, keep praising, keep praising. joy of the Lord this morning. Come on. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time of praise and worship where we've given you glory and honor and praise. Lord, you are certainly worthy of it. We are so thankful and grateful to be in your house today. In Jesus' name, and everyone say amen. Well, you may take your seats for just a moment. Woo. Well, today we have an awesome opportunity to continue and honoring God by taking communion together. Today, when you walked in, you should have received some communion elements. If you do not have those, please raise your hand up really high right now. So the ushers are going to make their way around and make sure you have that communion. So if you don't have it, please raise up your hand all over the room. At the top, it's fine. Just raise your hand as the ushers are making their way around right now to make sure you have that. When you receive those communion elements, you may work on opening them. There are two different tabs, a top tab that gives you access to the bread and another tab that gives you access to the juice. After you've opened it, please hold on to it as I will guide us in taking communion together. And if you're joining us online, welcome to church this morning. You can grab something that resembles bread and grab something that resembles juice. You can get that together and we can all take communion together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had a meal with his disciples. This is the meal we refer to as the Last Supper. And that meal was something that they'd done before because it represented the Passover, which was a time of God's grace and mercy shown to the nation of Israel. But that meal that night would represent so much more. It would represent a Passover for all of mankind, all of us, by the blood of the Lamb, and his name is Jesus. Communion is important because it allows us to become one with Christ. As Christ said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. That was Christ speaking. But communion is also important for us because it allows us to come together as a community, as a body, as a church of believers, unified, reflecting on the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus made because he truly died for us. But how many know he did not stay in the grave? He is alive right now and he reigns today. What a mighty God we serve, church. The Bible instructs us that before we take communion, that we should reflect. The Bible uses the words, let a man examine himself. In other words, just do a heart check, just reflect to make sure that we're taking communion with the right heart posture today. Let's do that to, uh, together, church. Let's take a moment to reflect. The bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Let's eat together. The juice represents the blood of Christ that was shed for us on the cross. And the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Let's eat, drink together, sorry. After we pray, the ushers will make their way around to collect those empty communion cups from you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time where we have reflected on the cross. And we are so grateful. We approach you with a grateful heart. 
understanding that the sacrifice that you made on the cross is the only reason that we're here right now. So, Lord, we are exceedingly grateful and thankful. And so today, Lord, we give you all glory, all honor, all praise. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say amen. Let's stand and worship. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now, and in the waiting, the same God who's never late, he's working all things out, working all things out. I, I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the Lord.
Praise your holy name, Jesus. We glorify you, we magnify you, Lord. You are good, you are worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to your name. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship your holy name, Lord. We thank you for this safe place we can be in just to glorify you, to just be thankful for you, Lord. I pray that as the word goes forth, we hear it, we understand it, and we take it with us, whether in our workplace or in our school or in our homes. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. It's been great worshiping with you guys. You may take your seats. We get excited to come here. The name is Family Christian, and you do feel like a family, for real. Family Christian Center. Family is is it. For me, I think it's the love. People here are basically like my second family, and I love them all so much. Pastor Becky. Thank you for how you stay real. Thank you for going to bat for us physically and spiritually. I salute you and I thank God for giving you that vision. Looking forward to all you're going to do in the next 30 years. Good morning, FCC family. My name is Angel, and I am thrilled that you joined us for church today. If you are looking to get more involved in the church or become a member, you should join us for Next Steps today. It starts at 12.45 p.m. in the Great Kids Room. Lunch and child care is provided. Since the service is today, you don't have to register. Just meet us in the lobby, and we will get you seated when the room is ready. Tomorrow night, we would love for you to join us for the Hearing of God's Voice class. This is a special service that we do every first Monday of the month where God speaks to his people through the gift of prophecy. You don't want to miss it. Join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Right now, we are in the middle of our Thanksgiving meal drive. Today, we are accepting canned goods, and next Sunday, we will be accepting turkeys. These items will be used to give to those families who need assistance with having a hearty Thanksgiving meal. Our food pantry will distribute these meals to those in need on November 18th from 10 a.m. to noon. Thank you for your heart to give to this amazing community outreach. If you don't know by now, I have an exciting announcement to share with you. Matt Marr will be here in concert this Thursday, November 9th at 7 p.m. If you would like to buy tickets, you can purchase them on his website at mattmarmusic.com. Buy now because tickets are selling out fast. Thank you for joining us in service today. We are kicking off a brand new series called Glad You Asked. Get ready to take some notes because you don't want to forget this message. Well, good morning, family. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? You're doing fantastic, right? Well, awesome. It is so, so good to see you all here today. I love you all. I love worshiping with you. Don't you just love coming to church? I mean, this is, this is an amazing, amazing place to be. Well, Pastor Rick is out today. How many love your pastors? Pastor Rick, Pastor Becky Van Wagner. I honor them. They are such incredible people. He's out today. So you are effectively right now stuck with me, okay? Don't, don't walk out. Don't walk out. Don't leave. But it's going to be an awesome, awesome day. But, man, it's November. Where did the time go? I feel like it was just the new year, right? It is what? Today is November 5th. Is that right? We are almost at the end of the year. I mean, time really, really flies. So yesterday, my wife put up the, the Christmas decorations at the house. I'm like, this is too early for that. And she, you did an incredible job. It looks great. Now, all you men in here, all you men, you know, okay, if, you, if you're married, five words where you know your wallet's going to take a hit. And that's, let's go to Hobby Lobby. 
That's, <laughs> you know your wallet's going to take a hit. It's Christmas time already, but in October we celebrated 30 years, y'all, 30 years of ministry. Isn't that incredible? We're going to be celebrating all year long, so make sure that you are here. Tell somebody, come to church with me because this is the greatest place ever, okay? So, man, it's, it's going to be awesome in this year. The rest of the year, we got Matt Marr this week. I mean, so many things. We'll get to that in just a second. But today, you have the opportunity. I have the opportunity. We will study together in the first installment of this series called Glad You Asked, where we take your questions, and then we address them. We use the Bible to answer those questions, and the question today we will address is, how to deal with distractions. If you're ready for the word, shout yes. yes. Here we go. I thought that was a little weak for as many of you guys are in here. If you're ready for the word, shout yes. yes. Uh -huh. Here we go. How to deal with distractions. Now, I want to talk about the world today. We are living probably in the fastest pace the world has ever been. This is the age of information. I remember when I was a young kid, I remember that watching the nightly news actually meant something. My parents watched the nightly news to keep up with what is going on in the world. And some of you that were born, you know, you know, in 80s, 70s, 60s, you know, whatever, some of you still watch the news at night, right? I, I still do. My wife loves the news right but the news now is not nearly as crucial as it was before because now if something happens at 2 p.m we know it at 2 p.m we can get on our phones right now and everything that's going on in the world in your pocket you've got all the information that the world has right in your hand this is the age of information information has never traveled any faster and you know what that's a really good thing until it's not until you are receiving so much information that you don't even know what's real, what's not real. You don't even know what you need to be focused on anymore because there's too much information in your life. So the age of information is really good until you know too much. And then what you know can ultimately become a distraction. So today we will talk about how to deal with distractions. Now I must warn you, if you wanted to hear a message about how to get rid of distractions, we're not talking about that today because we will not get rid of distractions. We just have to figure out how to manage them correctly. Amen, church? Here we go. Let's get started. I got to move quickly. Number one, identify the distractions in your life. Now, I know this is a very simple thing, but I think it's a great place to start. It's to try to figure out what are the things that are distracting me right now. Can I identify those things? Well, I want to define for you the word distraction. It's defined as a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else, a diversion. Diversion is a great word, right? It's diverting your attention away from what you need to be focused on. And that's the thing about our world today, right? Everything and everybody is trying to get your attention. You will be scrolling on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, and you'll be seeing all the content that you like. You'll see animal content and, and, and cooking content, baking content, all the stuff that you watch, right? And then all of a sudden you'll see an ad about a mop. And you'll be saying like, well, I, I don't need a mop. I, I, got, I got a mop at the house. And literally 60 seconds later you will have put your credit card information in and you'll be buying that mop, <laughs> But that's because they're fighting for your attention. They're trying to uh, attract attention because attention means money. So everything in this world is trying to grab your attention, which means you're going to face a lot of distractions, right? The world, they're, uh, they're appealing to your flesh. They're appealing to you trying to figure out what your flesh wants. And the Bible tells us that our flesh has desires and the spirit has desires. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 says this, so I I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary or opposite to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Think about that right there, that you have desires of your spirit that fight against desires of your flesh, and they're fighting so much against each other to literally prevent you from doing what you want. That's called a distraction, right? You got things and desires, and, and if you're not careful, I said this in the last two services, if you're not careful, a distraction will actually come from you. It'll actually come from your own desires because you will want so many things at once that it actually becomes a distraction. Be careful to not allow that to happen. Number two, distractions 
can be an attack by the enemy. Come on, church. We have got to mature in our faith to the level that we understand that some things are spiritual. Sometimes it's not always just physical. It's not always just, well, I'm distracted because this. Sometimes it's a strategic attack by the enemy to take your attention away from what God wants you to do right then. It's a, sometimes it's an attack. It's not always that you bring on the distraction. You will be piled up and overwhelmed with many things, and it's not always your fault. Sometimes it's the enemy literally coming to distract you. And what happens is when we start having all these feelings of being overwhelmed, it produces anxiety in our life. Church, do you know what I'm talking about? We start to feel anxious. I got this going on. I got to do this and I got this. And the list starts to get so long that you start to feel anxiety about it. That's the, that's the attack. That's the plan of the enemy. First Peter 5, 7 and 8 says this. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, here's the thing. It might not seem like it, but those distractions are an attack by the enemy because the scripture says, cast all your anxiety on the Lord. Now, it's not just saying that so that you would be free from anxiety, even though God does want that. It's saying that so that your mind will be alert. The Bible says so you can be alert. If you're not alert, you won't even recognize that the enemy is attacking you in the first place. You have to be alert enough, which means you have to cast your anxiety on the Lord. Because the very moment when you get tired and you're not alert and you're not aware, it's the very moment that the enemy is looking to attack. The very second you lose your awareness of what's going on, you've lost yourself, you've got so many things going on in your life, that is the moment that the enemy comes to attack. I say this, if the enemy can't destroy you, he'll distract you. If he can't just take you out, sometimes he'll just put so much on your plate that you don't get to see what God has for you. You have to be so careful, church. Come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give God praise on that. Come on. The Bible is telling us that the enemy is waiting. I mean, waiting on you to lose your focus. I mean, he's, I'm, I'm talking about he's sitting here right now with all of us in the room talking about if they lose their focus for a second, I am going to attack them. Look what the Bible says. Ephesians 6, 10 through 16. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all this take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one come on give God praise you're gonna have to recognize when the enemy is attacking you and be able to stand firm against it amen church number three identify what is important in your life this is very practical, right? So we had number one, which was identify the distractions in your life. You say, I, well, how do I identify distractions? Number two, understand distractions can be an attack by the enemy. And then number three, you will, it will help you to understand what are distractions if you identify what is important in your life. It's a very practical focus, right? Have to know what's important. The disciples, they asked Jesus in the scripture. This is Matthew 22. We'll read. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? The young adults that are with me, they know I recite this all the time. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's the thing. The disciples ask him, what is the most important thing? Because we want to identify what is important. Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor. See, I want to encourage you today that if you do not identify what is important in your life, you will waste time, energy, and effort in location locations where you shouldn't and let me tell you no matter how much money you got you cannot buy time back no matter how much money you got 
If you lose time, you lose time, okay? So you have to identify what are the things in my life that I need to actually spend time on. You have to identify those things. For me, I like to call it the three F's, okay? So the first one, faith. Make sure that your faith, your belief in God, make sure that that's first. Make sure that God is first. Let me tell you something. If you don't prioritize your faith, no one will. If you do not make it a priority to say, I am setting aside this time for God. If it's Sunday morning, I'm glad to see you all. You set aside this time and said, this is God's time. And don't let the world distract you from it. Don't let the world distract you from it. This is God's time. Maybe you're at the house, it's during the week. Man, just five or ten minutes, fifteen minutes in the day, cut out this time and say, this is God's time because I've got to make God a priority in my life. Let me tell you something. There's no such thing as a professional Christian. None of us are getting paid to believe. No such thing. No such thing. So whether you pray for two hours or 15 minutes, I'm telling you, as long as you cut time out for God, he will be pleased with the fact that you put him first. Some of us can pray for two hours. I know y'all looking at me like he must pray for two hours. No. No. <laughs> Come on, whether it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, five minutes, maybe you're at, you're at your job and you're finna go to lunch. And you say, man, I gotta, give, I gotta give God five minutes before I eat this nasty food. I gotta give God just, just, I'm talking about five minutes before I eat this food. Just make sure that you give God priority in your life. Amen, church? The second one, and can we be real with each other? Can I be real with you without getting kicked out of here? Number two, you got to prioritize your family. I'm telling you now, if this is the only chastisement and the rebuke that I have for you today, you need to spend more time with your family. Family is important. God instituted family. This is God's doing. Spend time with your family. Don't go seven days and you didn't spend any time with your wife. Sad. That's sad. Don't go seven days and not spend time with your kids. Not call your parents. Come on, call them on the phone. Five minutes. Five minutes. One day they're not going to be here. Five minutes. Call your mom. Call your dad. Call your son. Call your daughter. Well, I don't have a relationship. Leave a voicemail. Leave it and say, I'm thinking about you. I love you. I care for you. We ain't talked in five years. So what? Make sure that you cut out time to prioritize your family. When Jesus is literally dying on the cross, breathing his last breath, one of the phrases is that he told the disciples to take care of his mother. Take care of her. My mom, take care care of her. You have to prioritize your family. If you don't do it, no one will. And before you know it, your life will you'll be the end of your life and be thinking, man, I wish I had more time. You've got to prioritize time with your family. You have to. And now I understand this and, you know, this, this is a risky play for me because my family's in here. I understand that family sometimes can be the worst. And I'm not just talking about them. I've been the worst of them sometimes. Family can sometimes be the worst, but they steal your family. They steal your family. Prioritize time with your family. Amen, church? Amen? And, you know, number three, you know, I said the three Fs, right? Faith, family, football. You got to cut out. <laughs> you got to cut out some time for football. If you're not doing that, I'm, I'm sorry. There's prayer after service. You're not doing that? You got to cut out time for football. So all you wives in here, you heard it from the pastor. You heard it here first. Got to cut out time for that, okay? Cut out time. But seriously, something that you enjoy, make sure you cut out time to enjoy yourself. Cut out some time to do that. Go on vacation. I love when Pastor Rick says that. He said, take a break. Go on vacation. Go on vacation with your family. I mean, you just, just go, right? Just do something and cut out time because if you don't prioritize it, you will distract yourself and be doing so many things and you won't have near the rest you need to accomplish what you need to accomplish. And when you're tired, you will be distracted. Here we go, number four. 
Know the will of God for your life. Now, I know the first three were really practical. The first three really, like, you know, very normal. Now I want to talk about something spiritual. Know the will of God for your life. So Nehemiah, we're going to be looking at him for just a moment. In Nehemiah chapter 1, he's actually a cupbearer for the king. Now, he's a Jew. He's in Jerusalem, right? Nehemiah is a cupbearer for the king. And he goes to the king and he says, I want to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, right? So the the wall around uh, the city had actually been destroyed by the Babylonians around 586 B.C. uh, from the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar II. Okay, so that wall had been destroyed and that wall fortified the city. It was the safety and the protection and that wall also let the enemies know that God was with them. So it was very, very important to rebuild that wall. And Nehemiah says, "Uh, King, if you find grace with me, God finds favor on me, then let me. Let me go and build that wall. And what happens is he actually finds out that the building of the wall is what God wants him to do in that season of his life. However, even though he was doing what God wanted him to do, it does not mean that will separate you from the attack of the enemy. Let me tell you that this morning, church, just because you're doing what God tells you to do doesn't make you exempt from the enemy. So don't get discouraged when you come to the Lord. Y'all know, don't get discouraged when you come to the Lord and then everything goes wrong. That's the, that's the strategy of the enemy, right? So Nehemiah, he, he's going to rebuild this wall, and it's a great thing, but all his enemies, they hear about him building this wall, and they want to kill him. So let's, let's uh, pick up uh, Nehemiah chapter uh, 6, verse 1. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. So let me tell you what's going on. So Nehemiah is about to rebuild this wall that surrounds the city. It's going to fortify the city. It's going to let all the enemies know that the, the, the living, the God, God is with them in that city, and the enemies don't like that. And so they send a message to Nehemiah. They're real friendly. They're like, hey, let's, let's come talk about what's going on here. But Nehemiah instantly recognizes that this is a distraction. The way he knows that. It's because if God told him to build the wall in that season of his life, then that's what he's going to do. And anything that comes to take his attention off, he knows it's a distraction. That's why it's so important to know what God wants out of your life. Because when something comes to take you away from it, you'll recognize it. And so Nehemiah tells them, I cannot come to you. Because he figured out they're plotting to kill me. Now, you know what's very interesting in this passage? Nehemiah says, at this point, he had literally finished the whole wall except the doors in the gates were not placed. Meaning that he had literally gotten to the very end of finishing this task. And what happens as soon as he's about to finish, the enemy attacks. And in your life... A lot of times you will be doing something so great, you get, I mean, you're smooth sailing. And then right when you get to the end is when everything goes wrong. Everything. Like, man, I was literally almost finished. I almost had it. It's because that's a strategy of the enemy. Let me tell you why. The Bible says that everyone who had worked on the wall, they were tired. They just had no more energy to spend to this. And right at the moment that they're exhausted. It's when the enemy came to distract him. Now you want to know what Nehemiah could have said to them. Yeah, I'll meet you there. Let's go ahead and settle this. Let's just go ahead and settle this so I can tell you what's going on. And you want to know what would have happened if Nehemiah would have done that. They'd have killed him. You see, the enemy is waiting until you're exhausted and your judgment is questionable. That's when he's going to attack you. See, it's, it's called halt, H-A-L-T. They say halt. Don't make decisions when you're hurting, angry, lonely, or tired. H-A-L-T. H-A-L-T. Y'all remember this. Remember this. You know, put it on your fridge or something. Don't make decisions. Halt. Before you make the decision, make sure you're not hurting. Make sure you're not angry. Make sure you're not lonely. 
And make sure you're not tired. Make sure of those four things because if you do, your judgment is in question. And if something comes to attack you when you're hurting, you're angry, you're lonely, or you're tired, a lot of times we end up making the wrong decision. And when we make the wrong decision, we're going to end up distracted. Nehemiah is tired. But still, he has a task that God told him to do. And let me say this too. When God gives you something to do, you as a believer, maybe you're new, maybe you're not a believer, you who are believers, make sure that you stand firm on the word of God for your life. So if God told you to go work there for this season, then you need to work there for this season. If God told you to go to that university and get the degree, then you need to go to that university and you need to get a degree. If God said move houses, move cities, go to a different church, then you need to move houses, move cities, go to a different church, and don't let any devil take your attention away from what God has for you in this season. You have to have a resolve. A resolve that says, if God said it, I will see it through to completion. I think the reason a lot of us are distracted is because we won't complete what God has given us. We've got to complete it. What has God told me to do in this season, right? So let's keep reading. Nehemiah 6, verse 5. Then the fifth time Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. Don't they sound so nice? I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Some of you need to pray that today. Lord, strengthen me today, Lord. See, this is what's happening with Nehemiah. Now, the enemies tried another tactic. Now, he came at Nehemiah the first time, and he's like, let's have a conversation. Nehemiah says, I can't do that. Then he comes back to him with a letter. Now, they don't wrote, wrote a letter and sent it by pigeon or something. They don't wrote a letter, and he gets this letter, and he says, like, man, nothing y'all are saying in this letter is even true. And let me tell you something, church. The enemy will come attack you with a lie. He will come tell you you're not good enough, you cannot do it, you have too much on your plate, you're going to be overwhelmed, you're weak right now. He will tell you all of those things to make sure you don't focus on what God wants you to focus on. He will tell you you're not good enough for this. You'll say, well, God told me I'm supposed to do this. And there will be a little voice in your head that says, don't do it because you're not going to make it. Let me tell you, that's the letter that was sent by the pigeon. That's an attack by the enemy. That's a lie by the enemy. If God told you he's going to do it, then he's going to see you through it. If God brought you to it, then he's going to do it for you. You've got to learn to trust God with his word. Learn to trust God with his word. If he said it, it is done. And so Nehemiah says, man, nothing y'all are saying is true. He recognized it as a distraction, and he continues to do his work. Now look at this. He's nearing the completion, right? Nehemiah 6, verse 10. One day, this is Nehemiah talking, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and the son of Mehadabel, who was shut in at his home. Somebody he knows. Now Nehemiah is saying, I, this is somebody I know. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you by night they are coming to kill you but I said Nehemiah talking should a man like me run away or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life I will not go I realized that God had not sent him but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him this right here, this is, this is the mind-blowing part of the story. This is somebody Nehemiah knows. He goes to his house, and he says, he warns him. Look at this. This is how tricky the enemy can be. He warns him. He said, hey, man, people are coming to kill you, so we need to go to the temple. We got to get away from here because they're on their way to kill you here. Let's go to the temple, and we'll be safe there. 
See, the enemy is very tricky, very tricky. Because what would have happened to Nehemiah if he said, okay, yeah, let's go to the temple. You want to know what would have happened? They'd have killed him because they were waiting on him at the temple. And this come from a friend. Listen to this, church. Even though they're close to you, they can still be a distraction. If you don't know the will of God for your life, even those who love you can distract you. I want to tell you that this morning. If you don't know what God has for you, even those who are close to you can be a distraction. There's a friend. There's somebody he knows telling him, let's go here. But he was hired by somebody else. And the only way that Nehemiah knew it, he said, who am I that I should be doing that? No, no, no. God has not called me to do that, so I'm not going to do that. See, that's how you weed out the distractions in your life. You say, has God called me to do this? If the answer is no, then you know the enemy is trying to distract you. What has God called you to do in this season? Nehemiah knew it's on me to finish this wall. And had he listened to anything anybody told him, he would be dead. But you know what the scripture says? It said, Nehemiah completed the wall in 52 days because he refused to be distracted. I wonder how many things has God given you that you've not completed because you've been distracted. And how can we manage that? We got to know the will of God for our life. Number five. Always seek God first. You say, how do I deal with distractions? I'm going to close with this. Make sure that God is first in your life. Seek him first. Make sure that he's the top. You want to you know why? Because if you seek God first, he will keep you balanced. All your priorities will be balanced. If you seek God first, make sure you seek God. Say, God, is this what you want me to do in this season? If so, then your life will come into balance. I find a lot of times my life gets out of balance when I'm not listening to God anymore. I get out of balance. I get distracted. I get overwhelmed. And then I get anxious and I feel all these feelings. And what ultimately ends up happening is I don't complete anything. It's time to seek God first. Here's what the Bible says. Because I wanted you, to, I wanted you to know this: when you don't seek God first, when you don't, if you're like me, you start worrying about all the little details. Say, how is this going to get taken care of? How am I going to do this? How, all these little details. And the truth of the matter is, when you seek God first, you put those details in God's hands. Let me tell you something: you cannot manage everything. You can't. You cannot manage everything. You have got to mature to the point to where you've got to put some things in God's hands and trust him to take care of it. If you're focusing and spending time and energy on things you cannot control, you're distracted. You can't control it. So some things you're going to have to say, God, I place this in your hands and I cannot worry about it anymore because this is the thing I need to be worried about. So all these little things, Lord, I place that in your hands and I trust that you will take care of it. Trust God with the details. Look at what the scripture says, and I'm closing with this. Matthew 6, 26. It's a lot of scripture, so stay with me. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
you got to trust God with the details. Because if you get caught up in the details, I promise you, you're going to be distracted. As I said earlier, if the enemy cannot destroy you, he will distract you. You'd be caught up in so many things that God was already going to take care of. And then you get to the end of it and God took care of it. And you're thinking, man, what was I doing? Stressing every single night. Not getting no sleep about things that God had already worked out. You see, God didn't call you to manage all the little details. As much as you want to, as much as you want to have everything in your hands, you want to be in control. As much as you who say, if if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. God's got it under control. You have to trust God to be right. And I said this to the first two services, and let me encourage you today. I'm sorry if this hurts your feelings. Know that I love you. God does not need your help being God. He he doesn't. He doesn't need my help to be God. He's already God. I don't have to help him be God. So if he said he's going to take care of it, I'm not, I'm not going to say, but God, but God, but, but. He's God. He's got it. He's making provisions in places that you could never be. He's located in areas that you'll never see. You have to be able to trust him so that you don't get distracted. Everything's fighting for your attention. You don't want to get distracted today. That's how we deal with it. That's how we manage all the distractions. We have to identify the distractions in our life. We can do a good job doing that. You say, well, I don't know where they are. Well, then number two, you have to understand that some things are just an attack by the enemy. Understand that. It'll help you manage it. Or number three, you have to identify what's important in your life. Many of you are at that step today where I just have to identify what's important to me and make sure that I spend my time accordingly. Or maybe you're at the point today, number four, where you don't know the will of God for your life. And if you're at any one of those points, start with number five. Seek God first. You say, how will I know the will of God for my life? How will I know? Well, tomorrow night we have a service, a class where we learn how to hear the voice of God. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, you say, I don't know the will of God for my life. I'm trying to figure out my purpose. Well, I'm telling you tomorrow night will help you. 7 o'clock. Some of you have been here on Monday nights and you received a word from the Lord yourself and you know it sets your focus correct. (laughs) So make sure you're here tomorrow night. You see, the most dangerous distraction is the one you don't even know about. The most dangerous distraction is the one you don't even know is distracting you. Because by the time you figured out you're distracted, it'll be too late. But the greatest distraction, church, the greatest distraction that we face every day is sin. The greatest distraction that we face is sin. Above all the tasks and things that we have to do in our life, the distraction we face is sin. Sin is what separates us from God, cuts us off from God. He still loves us, of course. There's grace for sin. But getting entangled in sin causes you to be distracted away from the destiny that God has for your life. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders And the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. Church, today we have a chance to be honest and be real with ourselves. I don't know, I'm not being cliche here, but some of us have been entangled in sin. There are all different types. And I'm telling you right now, it's a distraction in your life. Let me be the first one to tell you it's a distraction. It's distracting you away from the things of God. And let me tell you something. I want the things of God in my life. Because if God gives it to me, it is done. But sin separates me from that. And I know it and you know it. That's the thing about sin, right? It's, it's not me telling you this as a pastor. You know when you're caught up in something you shouldn't be in. And you know when it's taking your time. You know when you don't put God first. Nobody needs to tell you that. You know it. And today we know when we're caught up and entangled in certain situations and things that we shouldn't be entangled in. But you want to know the good news. Today we have an opportunity to focus and turn our attention back to God. The Bible said there's new mercies for us every single morning. So understand this. Yeah, come on. There's new mercies today. Sin is the ultimate distraction. You know, you get caught and entangled in some kind of sin. And it can be anything, small, large, whatever. Man, it takes your mind off of what you need to be doing. It brings guilt and shame into your life. Even though the Bible says, all those who in Christ, there's no condemnation. So today you can be free from the entanglement. But only when we turn back to God. I want to pray with you this morning, church. Our Father in heaven, God of grace and mercy, today we honor you. Today we praise you. Today we give you glory. We felt your presence with us. And we are so grateful. Today, many of us are facing many challenging situations in our life. And if we're honest, a lot of us are feeling a, a lot overwhelmed. A lot of us feel like we're in way over our head. And we're distracted by everything that's coming our way. But today, Lord, we've decided to put our focus on you. To put you first to seek your voice, to hear from you. Oh, Lord, that's our desire. Maybe you're in here today and you never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Can I tell you that's the best decision you'll ever make? Because not only does it allow you to center yourselves and focus on God and help manage the distractions in your life, but it also secures a place in eternity in heaven with God. If you want to accept Jesus today, I would love to pray with you. Maybe you're in here and you're a different group of people. You've accepted Jesus before. But you've found yourself entangled in situations that separate you from God. You've found yourself distracted, not putting God first. You find yourself overwhelmed and not knowing what to focus on. And some of that is brought on by our own desires, the desires of the flesh. Maybe today you found yourself entangled in something and you want to turn back to the Father. Let me tell you that the Father's arms are wide open. I believe he smiles when we turn back to him. If that's you, and you know if it's you, if that's you and you want to turn back to the Father today, I would love to pray with you. We call that rededicating your life to Christ. If you're in either one of those two categories, if you want to accept Jesus for the first time or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, will you just boldly put your hand up right now so I can see who I am praying for? Come on, do it boldly. Yes, 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 come on. Today's the day. Yes, come on, come on. Yes, yes, yes top yes 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 come on yes yes come on today's the day yes yes anybody else I see those hands yes yes 
anybody else. Come on, today's the day of redemption. It's the day to turn back to the Father. New mercies, new mercies, new mercies. It's amazing. In a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. And I believe, if you believe this prayer with all your heart, that you will be saved today. So will everyone repeat after me, but especially those who raised your hand. Everybody, will you say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died for me and that you rose again and that you're alive right now. So please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. Help me to be the person you want me to be. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, can we give it up for Jesus today? Come on, new mercies, new mercies, new grace. Come on. Can we give it up for Jesus today? Hallelujah. You were just guided through the salvation prayer. If you gave your heart to Jesus today, you have made the best decision ever. We would like to connect with you and help guide you in your next steps with your relationship with Jesus. You can text FCC Guest to 97000 to connect with our team. Now is the time in our service where we prepare to give our tithes and offering. If this is your first time tuning in with us, please feel no obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. If you call FCC your church and you want to participate in giving today, you can text FCC Give to 97000 or you can give securely online at FCCLive.com slash give. I'm going to take this time to pray over our offering. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with. I pray, Lord, that you will help use this money to further your kingdom. In your name I pray, amen. If you would like prayer today, you can text FCC Prayer to 97000 and a member of our team will reach out to you. Thanks for joining us for church today. We hope that you have the best week ever.